Welcome to Our View. This show plays on Channel 17 for a month, at least five times a week, and sometimes more. We are on Sundays at 3.30 a.m. and 11.30 a.m., Monday at 7 a.m., Thursday at 5.30 p.m., and Saturday, oh, whoops, I have to go back, Thursday at 7.30 p.m., and Saturdays at 5.30 p.m. And today I am so pleased to have as our guest a well-known writer, director, producer, John Orland. Welcome, John. Well, it's very nice to be here, Laurie. I just found out that John and I were both on the faculty for Lee Strasberg around the same time. John taught screenwriting, and I taught uh, actor, director, teacher, writer's workshop where we gave performances for the public. And I was also the only faculty member that Lee asked to teach understanding of the method, which led to my book. But John, I want to start with your life. What brought you out to the West Coast in 1961, and where were you born? <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Aha, uh -huh. Franklinstown. Okay. Yes, and I was a very shy youngster, mm -hmm. very shy. I couldn't look people in the eye. Uh, I turned away. Uh, I was very insecure. It took me a long time to speak. I kind of invented my own language, and. Um, the shyness uh, led to the um, hiding, and, and what I did is I, um, I got very interested in photography because holding a camera in front of my face, I could look at someone and they couldn't look back at me, or at least I felt they weren't looking back at mm -hmm. me because the, the camera and the lens uh, were a shield, and also I could hide out in the dark room uh, in the basement of my parents' home where I mixed my own chemicals. So how did you happen to come to the West Coast then uh, as a photographer? Well, my dream was <coughs> to come to Hollywood as a director of photography. However, I, however, I got involved in live entertainment. Uh -huh. And uh, I worked uh, for uh, Frank Ford, Lee Goober, and Shelley Gross at the Camden County Music Fair. I was stage manager, mm -hmm. stage manager of um, No Time for Sergeants and uh, Damn Yankees. Oh, those are very well known. Yes. Yes. And then I also worked, I was stage manager at the Latin Casino Theater Restaurant in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, uh, in charge of um, the Johnny Mathis show, the Patty Page show, and Steve Parker's holiday uh, in Japan. And as we said earlier, at one time Steve Parker was married to Shirley MacLaine and they had a daughter. And so there's a lot of connections in show business. Yes. And so what brought you then to the West Coast from all those jobs in the East? Well, my, my dream was to come to Hollywood, always mm -hmm. to come to Hollywood, mm -hmm. even as um, a seven or eight year old. Well, that was my dream too. Yes. <laughs> right. In, in fact, um, I'll share this with you. Hmm. I used to take the center roll yeah. from a, 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 a toilet paper roll, the center carton that was mm -hmm. round, mm -hmm. and hold it up to my eye like a viewfinder and pretend I was making a movie. Uh huh. With a toilet paper roll. <laughs> So our dreams did come true. I uh, came to Hollywood uh, to teach for Lee Strasberg, and uh, that led to uh, writing my book, Strasberg's Method, which is still being sold. And, and I know you have a script you want to show where you kept rewriting. And I certainly understand that because I kept rewriting. It took me like 14 years because I kept bringing it up to date with pictures. Oh, yes and new information, and uh, the book is now selling still very well, Strasberg's Method at Amazon and mm -hmm. Samuel French, and, 
And this is your script where you rewrote, and I certainly identify. Yeah, well, this is a script. Uh, I actually uh, wrote the original, mm -hmm. and then uh, this, of course, was before word processing and computers. Oh, I know. So that, that's this was what done I did on do. a typewriter, uh -huh. and then what I would do is I would almost like a sculptor. I, I would take what I wrote and mold it into the shape that I wanted to be. And my wife, Marsha, somehow found a way to make sense of my scribbles and would type up the pages. Oh, that's wonderful. And then I would do the same thing again and rewrite those pages in scribbles and she would, uh, she would retype it for me. Oh, it's wonderful to have help. I had help yes. from my daughter, Diane Hull, and from my husband-to-be, William Smithers, uh, editing my book also. And fortunately, Lee Strasberg himself was able to see it mm -hmm. and tell me it was correct. You know, it took me 14 years to finally publish it. Well, I, I have projects I've, I've been working on for many, many years. I'm sure. And to me, the, the test of a project is that you're as interested in the project at the end of the journey as you were in the beginning. In fact, I'm always more interested at the end of the journey because it is so much more than I thought it would be when I started the journey. And then with a book, one reissues with new pictures and new information, and I'm sure with a script, thank God you have Marcia to help you with typing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, now, right. I, now I don't need someone helping. <laughs> now uh, you're on the typing. internet. No, no, no. no. I, well, I'm on a computer working. I see. Uh -huh. and, and Marcia will proofread me from uh, okay. time to time. Now, uh, you have told some stories about, did you work with Steve McQueen, or were you going to work with him? Uh, we both had a connection yes. with Steve McQueen. Well, the, the page that I, I just um, showed you. Yes. Uh, is a page from a script I was hired to write for Steve McQueen. Uh, Ray Stark at Columbia Pictures. Very well known. Yes, mm -hmm. hired me to write the screenplay. And during the course of my writing uh, the screenplay, uh, Steve was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was supposed to meet him in Porterville where he had his motorcycles and airplanes which is not that far from here. Mm -hmm. And the day the limousine was to come to my house, they canceled, the studio canceled. And of course, I became insecure that maybe Steve McQueen was no longer interested in the project, not you knowing. You didn't realize he was dying of cancer? No, no. I see. Well, my connection is that his daughter, Terry McQueen, studied in my acting classes for a long time. And she looked just like Steve. And then when my daughter and I taught overseas, I think it was maybe at a Stanislavski conference in Paris, uh, Steve's first wife, Neil, uh, taught some of my classes for me because Terry was in the classes. And she looked just like Steve. And my husband, William Smithers, uh, used to ride motorcycles with Steve. They'd ride all over, and he was in Papillon with Steve and yes. Dusty. Uh, my husband played the uh, prison warden. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned Dustin Hoffman because you told a very interesting story about him and how you were connected with him, too. Well, Dustin Hoffman <laughs> uh, came to a seminar at the Lee Strasberg Theater yes. Institute. Uh -huh. And uh, actually, Lee was there. Where we both were on the yes. faculty. And yes, and during a break, I struck up a conversation with Dustin Hoffman, and he was telling me that on Papillon, he arrived on the location and sat in his hotel room expecting the director would come and talk to him about his role. But he sat there day after day, and the director didn't show up because uh, the director was spending time with Steve McQueen because Steve felt he needed some help. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, Dustin felt that he needed some help, but the director had enough trust in Dustin Hoffman to just let him sort of vegetate or veg <laughs> in his hotel room, but it, it put Dustin Hoffman through the ringer. I'm sure. I'll have to tell my husband that story. He told how he would go out to eat with Allie and Steve, because mm -hmm. Allie McGraw was Steve's wife at that time. Yes. 
and I don't, uh, I don't think he expected any help from the director <laughs> in his role with the two of them. So uh, you have so many different stories about uh, various people that I think would be yes. in well, well, interesting show, show to business. our people. Yeah, excuse me. Well, right. show business is just an exciting environment right. uh, to be in. Six and degrees of separation yes. for all of us. I, I right. started out in Hollywood as a newsreel cameraman. Mm -hmm. I was a newsreel cameraman for KHJ television. And at the time, the newsreel cameras were huge. You wore them on a body brace in front of you. you they didn't s sit on your shoulder. And it, they weighed 30 or 40 pounds, and you were tethered to your audio recordist, and you were also tethered to the on-air reporter. So it, you were tethered in a three, three people were tethered together. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was good. One of the reasons I was good is because I was big. And I could elbow my way through all of the other cameramen. And I'm sure you had a good eye, too, and I had a about very good what eye. the camera should yes. pick up. Yes. Now, I have to tell a story about our former employer, uh, Lee Strasberg. Mm -hmm. He used to always watch the news because he said that was the best reality acting. And he wanted acting to be real like you saw on the news. Yes. You know, and he well, would compare reality acting to people on the news. I learned a lot from uh, <laughs> filming the news. Yes. I was in a lot of situations. Uh, I was with uh, President Johnson. I was cleared mm -hmm. by the um, uh, Secret Service to be with him. Mm. Uh, it was at the Century Plaza in Los Angeles the day of the, they called it the Century Plaza uh, riots because the Vietnam War was uh, being waged at the time. Oh, I remember. Oh. And uh, thousands of people showed up at the Century Plaza to protest. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was very interesting for me is when I was with the protesters, looking at the police with their uniforms and raised batons, I kind of was on the side of the protesters, yes, looking at them. Yes, yes. But then when I crossed over, because I had a police pass, mm -hmm. and I was able to cross over and then be with the police, standing behind them, the protesters looked very menacing. And it was really a switch. It was almost uh, like being schizophrenic, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. because I was with the protesters, and the police were the bad guys. Mm. Then I was with the police and the protesters were the bad guys. And then somehow, and I don't remember specifically, I wound up in a hotel room in the Century Plaza looking out at the entire protest mm. with Walter Winchell. Oh, what good shots. <laughs> And what good Wal shots Wal you got. <laughs> and I didn't do any shots. I, Walter Winchell was just repeating and repeating and repeating. They're all a bunch of communists. They're all really? a bunch of communists. And I kept my mouth closed. <laughs> but I, I thought it was really a privilege to be standing next oh, to Walter so Winchell. So many of us were against that Vietnam War. Oh, yes. I was living in Wisconsin, and I talked to my Senator Proxmire about it. And I had a son who was 27 in the draft, and I was just thanking God that he stayed in school and had a student deferment and didn't have to go to Vietnam. And I had a friend, who uh, Jane Hamilton, who covered Vietnam, and she said, those guys, when they come back, are hooked on drugs. That's what they had to take in order to bear it. And I could tell that in my teaching at the, you know, at the Strasbourg oh, yes. Institute. Uh, one time, um, I always asked Shelley Winters to talk to all of the classes that I taught, and one night I invited all the classes at the Institute in to hear her talk and ask questions. And a guy came up those stairs, staggering in, and he had to be escorted out and come to find out he was a Vietnam veteran. And you know Shelley, she could hardly wait to get home to call Lee to tell him what had happened. I'm sure. And the next morning, Lee asked me right away, what happened last night? <laughs> Shelley was always calling Lee when she couldn't sleep and 
you know, <laughs> anything at the Institute. So but I, that was a horrible time yes, in our history. It was. Mm -hmm. I ended up going to uh, USC. Uh -huh. And I, I went at night and took every uh, class in the cinema department. What years were you there? I was there, it was probably about 1960, 1963, 65. Oh. And, and, and uh, the cinema department uh, then, there were only three uh, universities in the United States that offered degrees in cinema. It was NYU, UCLA, and USC. Yes. And many people don't realize that the cinema, de cinema department at USC was formed by the uh, Motion Picture uh, Academy, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Yes, I knew that. Because 10 years later, my son, Don Hall, was one of, I think, 30 people accepted in the cinema department at USC. And he was in the same class as Robert Zemeckis. Oh, yes. And uh, he was accepted because of a film that he had done at the University of Wisconsin. So I was very aware that it was one of the top cinema schools. And at the time, the facility was very crude. Uh, uh -huh. We had uh, a house, a wooden house, and that house uh, had a screen and projector. And I took a class, uh, Arthur Knight. Oh, who, who yes. Who was the great uh, reviewer. Credit, reviewer. Oh, yes. Very uh, well known. And in the winter, we had to sit in the screening room with overcoats on and jackets. <laughs> it was so cold. It was very, very crude, the entire cinema department. Yes. And I think by the time my son got there in the early 70s, it was, had much better facilities. Yes. And I, I know he did a uh, he did a film starring his sister, and you know he uh, he learned a lot. But then he went back to Wisconsin. Oh. <laughs> he didn't want to live in California. But you and I, we love living in California, right? Well, I, I <laughs> yeah, I I love living uh, here. I, I do too. But I came here specifically for the business mm -hmm. because I didn't know a soul, and uh, this was where movies were being made mm -hmm. and the uh, the first uh, my first job as a newsreel cameraman I got to attend all of the Hollywood premieres and uh, I, I really saw that people politicians and and successful people I was six feet away from all of these people and and I, I saw that they were they were human beings uh, and I wanted to be more than a newsreel cameraman. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was, I was at the ambassador when uh, Kennedy was Ke shot? Robert Kennedy. Oh my I was, God, uh, how terrible that was. I was in the first Watts riots. I was written up uh, in uh, the Los Angeles Times mm -hmm. as providing the second best coverage of the Watts riots, I, I beat out NBC, ABC, and CBS. <laughs> well, congratulations. And only KTLA <laughs> got a better review, and that's because they had what they called the telecopter, which uh -huh. was a helicopter. Uh -huh. and, and KTLA had their own helicopter, which was called a telecopter. Well, were you still doing that when Carter ran? No. Well, no. because I went as a delegate for him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wondered. By that time, you'd moved on to movies? Yes. But I, I've, yeah. I've stood on the tops of most of the buildings downtown at the topping out ceremonies. Mm -hmm. I was uh, at the, uh, uh, the opening of, of, of so many different places, like the Music Center, and, and uh, just experienced. Los Angeles, and, and you must remember, it was one of my early jobs, and I didn't know the city. And I had a Thomas Guide map, oh, boy. and <laughs> then I would be told I had to go to a specific location because something was happening, and I didn't know where the heck it was. Oh. And, and I had to find these places. Mm -hmm. For instance, to cover the mayor, uh, Mayor Yorty, I believe, was the mayor at the time. Well, I would park way out on the street and have to lug all of this equipment 
But then when you know, you park in City Hall Garage. Yes. There's a special place for press. Yes. And then there's a special elevator that you take. So when did you start becoming a, a newsman? I, I stopped in about 1967. Uh-huh. 67, 68. Uh-huh. Uh, by then, that, I was also uh, Cleet Roberts personal cameraman, uh -huh. and, and Cleet was a, a, a wonderful, wonderful reporter, and we traveled together and uh, did a lot of uh, stories, human interest stories, and then I decided, because my company was successful, that led to uh, my directing documentaries for NBC, uh, I directed three documentaries for the O&O division, and uh, was very successful with those. Uh, I did Art Linkletter's house party remotes whenever uh, they did a, uh, a segment that was outside of the studio, CBS uh, Television City. And you were the director for those? No, I, I shot. The uh, cinematographer. I was the cinematographer, but mm -hmm. as cinematographer, I was also the director because I was told that I had to cover something. So you have to decide as the cameraman where you're going to place yes. the camera, how high or low the camera will be placed, and when you're going to film. Because remember, this was before videotape or electronic acquisition, and you only had so much film. And if you had a 100-foot load in your camera, you had three minutes before you had to change. And therefore, you had to be very, very perceptive as to when to roll the camera, when not to roll the camera, because the worst thing that could happen would be that you run out of film and have to change just when the story gets interesting. <laughs> and I remember learning a lot from Robert Surtees. And I remember uh, when my daughter did her first movie with Ilya Kazan, he would have conferences constantly with Surtees about where the camera should go and what they were doing. And I learned how important the cinematographer was, you know, well, and, and I picked both their brains. <laughs> yes, especially <laughs> then know. because the yes. film speed, yes. which means the amount of silver on the film that actually collects the image and tarnishes and therefore becomes a negative, the film speeds were very slow meaning you had to have a lot of light. This was the late 60s? Yes. 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 This was about fall of 68. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, for instance, when I filmed using 16 millimeter, which uh, is what I used mostly, the film speed of uh, their Eastman Kodak uh, Ektachrome commercial was 12, meaning there was no image if you shot an automobile in the bright sunlight where the tires and underneath the, t uh, underneath the car was, it would just be a black mass. Now we only have five minutes left. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going so right, What interesting stories about your life or others that you would like to tell? I know you wanted to tell how you got to the big black tower at Universal. Yes, yes. So <laughs> I'm going to throw the ball to you now. Well, uh, <laughs> the way I got to the big black tower was I decided as I was approaching my late 20s that I had to make the move to feature films uh -huh. because I would be over the hill soon. So I started looking for screenplays and I couldn't find any because they were mimeographed at the time and you couldn't f get a screenplay because they only made 50 copies or 75 copies. Plus, the agents wouldn't talk to me. I was successful in documentaries, I was successful in news, I was successful in commercials. I flew on a, on a, a, a flying tiger, a, a freighter with Shamu, the whale. I mean, I, I did all these crazy things, but I had to get into features. So I tried to describe what I was looking for, and a telephone operator at this one agency said, you know, I think I have something. She told me the, the, the storyline briefly, and I said, I love it. But the agent wouldn't give it to me. But the telephone operator did. 
And she said also there was a young man from Long Beach attached as the director. Was that Steven Spielberg? Steve Spielberg. <laughs> Steve Spielberg. <laughs> I was his first producer. Oh, terrific. At Universal Studios. However, we weren't able to cast the movie. Oh, my daughter was in one of his amazing stories. Oh, yes. She was yes. fortunate to work for him. Yes, I yes. was on the set of, of his first uh, television directing assignment when he did uh, Night Gallery. Uh huh. And, uh, but Steve and I, uh, became friends. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, whenever I run into him, we, we always hug and say, say hello. Right. Um, my wife and friends have said, well, why don't you ever contact him and maybe go to work for him? Uh -huh. And I tell them, well, he was working for me. <laughs> and I will go back to him with the right project. Mm -hmm. And I have gone <coughs> back to him with one project some years ago. Did but, it uh, come to Well, the thing is, he had a project in the same genre. It was I a, see. It was a pirate movie. Mm -hmm. And because he was doing his uh, pirate movie at, uh, it might have been MGM at the time, he couldn't read my screenplay. But um, I have a project right now. It's called Sarasota, and it's a Western, shot in Sarasota, Florida in 1874, and it takes place really in an environment where there are swamps, alligators, and mosquitoes. That's Sarasota. <laughs> and that's Sarasota, especially in 1874. Are you taking that to Spielberg? Or well, when, when we get all of the elements together, for instance, well, the, I wish you well. the budget, thank you. Uh, hopefully, if that comes to fruit, uh, you know, to bear fruit, why let me know. We'll have you on again just to talk about Sarasota. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I would love to. <laughs> because I didn't realize until today that you're on the board of this station, yes. as my husband was for a long time. And we have this common background with Lee Strasberg, where for 12 years I was his senior faculty member and you were teaching screenwriting. Correct. And uh, that was my writing was the book about him and, yes. the, and the DVDs, and you've gone on so much further. So thank you for being on the show, and any final words you'd like to say? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for having me on your show. You're and most welcome. My final words are, you must believe in what you're doing, and you mustn't stop what you're doing if you want to succeed. I agree. And my life story is up on SB Datch, Just Between Us, where uh, it's under Smithers, my married name. And I end by telling the young people in the audience, persevere. Same thing you're saying. Yes. The, <laughs> you and I really are on the same wavelength. I, I think we are. Yes. I, in fact, <laughs> right. I know so. <laughs> so I believe that <clears throat> ends our show. And I thank the crew, uh, Mark, our director, Tyler and Diane, who are volunteers, and the interns who are with us. Uh, 